Hello, friends. We are so glad you've joined us. We are in lesson number 10 of our Sabbath School Quarterly for fourth quarter 2023, God's Mission, My Mission. And the title for our lesson this week is Mission to the Unreached, Part 1. You are going to be joined by our 3ABN uh, family panel, Sabbath School panel family, which is to my left. We're going to start here with Daniel. Thank you. I've got Monday's lesson, which is Paul in the Areopagus. Paul in the Areopagus. And to your left, Jill. Thank you so much, Pastor James. On Tuesday, I look at Paul and the unknown God. All right. And to your left, Shelley. Wednesday's lesson is introducing a new God. And last but not least, on the end there, Pastor John Lomacain. Mine is entitled Crossing a Line. Crossing a wow, line. what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> so we're, again, we're so glad you've joined us. We are looking forward to getting into this week's lesson. It's Reaching or Mission to the Unreached, Part 1. So next week we're going to have Part 2. And what does it look like to reach out or do a mission to the unreached? What insights can we take from the Bible that will help us on that mission to the outreach? Of course, before we get started, we want to have a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Daniel if you pray for us. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, it's with great confidence that we come to your word, knowing that it will never lead us astray. And so when we do that, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide our minds and our thoughts, that the words we speak will come from your inspiration and the thoughts we think will direct us to you, praise you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Thank you, Daniel. So our Sabbath School lesson entitled again, Mission to the Unreached, is primarily going to focus on Acts chapter 17. I'll be looking at the first 15 or 16 verses, and then your Sabbath School panel family will be picking up on some of those extra verses, taking us all the way through the chapter. Sabbath afternoon, we have a memory verse. It's taken from Acts chapter 17, verse 24. I'm reading from the NIV. It says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And let's just start Sabbath afternoon with kind of an overview of chapter 17, verses 1 through 16. Paul, as we begin this chapter, Paul is preaching in Thessalonica. And he's reasoning, as his, as his manner is in verse 2, he's reasoning three Sabbath days, so he's there for at least three weeks, uh, with the Jews out of the Scriptures. And he's focusing on Christ, who is the focal point of the Old Testament scriptures, the, the Christ who is the Messiah and the Christ who has died and resurrected. And as he's preaching Christ, some of them, verse 4, believe and some of them do not believe. Mm -hmm. Those who believe and some are devout Greeks and chief women, those who believe take their stand for Christ, but those who do not believe not only turn away from what Paul is preaching, but they actually become persecutors of Paul. And the persecution becomes really intense. And you're going to find that whenever Christ is lifted up, whenever Jesus Christ and Him crucified is preached, you're going to find that Satan will come in and he will try to, to stomp out that message, that proclamation. He will bring persecution. In Revelation chapter 12, that persecution looks like waters of a flood to put out the fire of the Holy Spirit that God ignites as we lift up Jesus Christ and Him crucified because we're told the Holy Spirit comes and when He comes, He's going to testify of Jesus. Whenever people are testifying of Jesus in the truth of, the God, of God's Word, you can know that it's the Holy Spirit working through them. So the Jews were moved with envy, verse 5. They took some of the baser sort, some of the lower class of the people, and they assaulted the house of Jason, and they were trying to find Paul and bring him out. And so as, as the story goes on here, uh, the people were troubled. The rulers of the city, when they heard these things, and uh, they, they tried to sort things out. But the brethren, verse 10, immediately send Paul and Silas away in the night to Berea. So Paul goes from Thessalonica to Berea. Now, what happens when he get, Paul gets to Berea is he doesn't say, well, oh, I'm so thankful I got out of that situation. I'm never going to do that again. I, 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 you know, I've just got to stop causing problems and preaching Christ. No, he says, okay, here's another town. Time to get to work again. I've got to, I've got to preach Christ again. And so it, that's what he does. He goes he, straight to work. He starts preaching. And what we find here, and this is one of the texts that we quote a lot because it's a 
principle that is so powerful in our study of the Word of God. It says when he, when he went there to preach in the synagogue in uh, Berea to the Jews, verse 11, it says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and they searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Beautiful principles that we have here, right? Yes. You've got to be open to receive the Word. Paul says, prove all things and then hold fast that which is good. And then of course, as you are open to receive the word, don't go by what the pastor says. And, and there's a number of reasons for that, but I just want to share one at least. Don't go, by, go just by what the pastor says because you want to know the word of God for yourself. So yes. go back to the word of God and read it for yourself. And God is going to give you your own unique insight and understanding to the word, even though the pastor just preached it, you're going to have an insight to that word as you go back and study it for yourself that will be yours, all yours, and you'll share that with others. So that's what the Bereans do. They're more noble than Thessalonians. They go back, they search the Word of God for themselves, and many of them believe. Now that's what happens when the Word of God is preached and you go back and study it for yourself. The Holy Spirit works over time. Many believe, uh, also the honorable women and Greeks, and of men, not a few. I like that. And of men, not a few. So there were a lot of believers there that, that came in to the truth through Paul's preaching in Berea. So don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged when you're persecuted, when you go through opposition. Don't be discouraged. Just just pick up and let the Holy Spirit work in your life and go again to wherever situation or circumstance you're in, whatever town or village you're in, whatever house or home, uh, maybe it's just in your neighborhood, try again to lift up Jesus Christ. He'll draw men unto Him, John 12, 32, and you will see people accepting the Lord as their personal Savior. And then it says, um, that when the Jews, verse 13, heard that Paul had gone to Berea, guess what they did? They said, well, we're so glad he's out of this town. You know, that troublemaker's not here anymore. No, they pursued him. They followed him. And it, you think, well, is it me? Is it? No, it's not you. The Jews are inspired by the devil. In fact, in another part of this story, Paul says Satan hindered him. Now, we know it was the Jews that were hindered him, but Paul actually says it was Satan that hindered me um, from going back there um, to, to visit you. And he worked through the Jews to do that. And so they trot, it says here in verse 13, when they heard that Paul was at Berea, they came there, there also and they stirred up the people. And so then in verse 14, immediately the brethren sent Paul away as it were by the sea and Timothy and, and Silas ab abode there and they conducted Paul, verse 15, they conducted Paul and brought him unto Athens, receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy for us all to come to him with all speed and they departed. So Paul basically is ushered off to Athens and, and here it's supposed or understood perhaps more clearly in the, in the following verses that there probably aren't a lot of Jews in Athens. Mm -hmm. There probably aren't a lot of, so Paul's kind of been ushered off to a safe haven. Like, okay, the Jews pursued you in Thessalonica, the Jews pursued you in Berea, now we're gonna take you off to Athens, there's just a bunch of Greeks there. There's no Jews there. So you'll be safe for a little while. Paul's like, yeah, I'll be safe, but I'm all alone. Uh, I want Timothy and Silas to join me as soon as possible. Uh, I don't know if I should pre, Oh, of course I've got to preach Christ here. Doesn't matter if there's no Jews here. I need to preach Christ wherever I go. And so Paul's getting ready to preach Christ. Again, we pick the story up in verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given over to idolatry. And that's the verse we want to focus in on here. Saul's spirit was stirred in him. I love this. What God is telling us here is that the Holy Spirit is contending with the hearts and minds of men and women who are worshiping idols. Mm -hmm. And that Holy Spirit that fills us, stirs us. We, we, we can't sit by complacently while people are worshiping false gods that are going to lead them down a path to doom and destruction. God wants to do something to reach them. And when God's Spirit is in us, He's going to stir us to do something yes. to reach those multitudes. And so Paul has just barely escaped, you know, from Thessalonica and he's barely escaped from Berea. And we know, according to, to the rest of the Bible, that, that Satan's on his track. Mm -hmm. Satan is, and, and Paul could, in the context of this, he could easily lose his life in, in Athens too if he's not careful. There's been a few wise men past history that have done the same and he's warned about that. But Paul is stirred with the Spirit of God. Friends, when you are stirred with the Spirit of God, you are going to do and dare for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we see happening here in Athens. So the quarterly goes on to tell us that Paul uh, was found in Athens 
And therefore, Luke writes, he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the Gentiles before this, of course. And in, oh, excuse me, no, this is in Acts chapter 17, verse 17. He reasons with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers in Athens and in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. So we do find some Jews in Athens. We do, do find some uh, believers in Athens, but Paul is primarily now stepping into the marketplace. Reaching people in the marketplace is what God is calling us to do. Not just in our comfort zone, not just in our churches among believers, but reaching into the marketplace. And Paul steps into the marketplace and the quarterly goes on to say, naturally Paul would have been the most comfortable working among the Jews, his own flesh and blood, but Paul refused to be satisfied with working among, only among his people. He had been called to reach others as well. Yeah. Paul could have worked just with God-fearing Gentiles uh, whose worldview was already, had already undergone substantial change. They had a biblical foundation uh, that Paul could build upon even if they still needed to know the God whom, feared, whom they feared, Jesus the Messiah. But as the quarterly goes on, no, 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 no. While in Athens, a city famous for its philosophy, Paul sought to reach the people there as well. Many of these had a radically different background and a worldview from those of the Hebrews and their sacred history, so, uh, which formed the foundation of their faith. And Paul wanted to reach and teach the Athenians. How did Paul, Paul go about seeking to reach these people? And what can we learn from his attempts? Well, that's what we're going to find out as we continue our study in uh, Acts chapter 17. But let me just say this. Paul had this burden for the world because he knew that it was in God that they lived and moved and had their being. And this is something that's brought out la later in the lesson in, in Acts chapter 17. Paul knew that Jesus Christ had died to ransom mm -hmm. even those who did not believe in him. That's what we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6. Paul knew Romans chapter 12, verse 3, that God had given a measure of faith to everyone. Paul knew that Jesus Christ, Hebrews 2, 9, had died for all men. Paul knew that he was the Savior of all men, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Paul knew and understand, and, and so did others of the writers of the New Testament. John said in John chapter 1, verse 9, this is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. And John said in John chapter 3, verse 16, and Jesus Christ loved the world, or God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not just believers, not just Christians, but the world. John knew and Paul knew that God had a burden for the entire world and Paul was putting himself out there. Whatever his situation, whatever his, his circumstance, he wasn't on Athens on a vacation. He wasn't there to, to look at the history of the Greek gods and, and, mm -hmm. and, and go to the museums. He was there to preach the gospel and no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, when the, when the Spirit of God is in us, it will stir us to do the same. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor James. I'm always amazed at Paul's ministry. Every time you, know, you study through the epistles and uh, he just, th this person who devoted his life to the service of God is inspiring to me. Amen. Uh, before we go to the center of power in Athens, I want to take you back to the center of power in Rome just for a minute in Romans chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Paul introducing to the Romans, you know, the, you know, the power center, all roads lead to Rome. Mm. Verse 14 of chapter one, he says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me <laughs> with all that I have, I am ready, predisposed is another way to translate mm. that, predisposed to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. This is one of those statements for me that defines Paul, where he says, I am a debtor. I could never pay God back for what he's done for me, so mm -hmm. I'm gonna keep on paying back what God has done by giving what he has given to me to you. All right, so he's always going all out to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. The first line of the lesson here on Monday's lesson says five words, no matter where he was, mm -hmm. Paul, given his commission from God, was going to preach the gospel. And that's just what he was all about. Like you said, he wasn't there for a history tour. He says, take me to where the people are. Mm -hmm. I want to go to where the people are. Have you ever been in a, a crowded city on a freeway and you look around and you see there are so many people. Mm -hmm. And you hear the music coming out of their car, see the t-shirts or the bumper stickers, and you're overwhelmed with the number of ideas and beliefs that everybody has. Mm -hmm. How can we reach so many people? Mm -hmm. in, in this situation, Paul had one goal, the very next verse in Romans 1, I am not ashamed 
of the gospel. Mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed. Paul speaks very personally about his commitment. I have no shame in this. This is no game to him. He won't shrink back. He doesn't get embarrassed by it. It defines his personal life, his professional life. He's willing to be stoned. He's willing to be whipped. He's willing to be mm -hmm. shipwrecked. He's willing to have to run for his life, bitten by snakes, flogged, beheaded mm -hmm. if possible. Mm -hmm. And we know all of those things are true. This dominates every waking minute of his life. When he's stoned in the city of Lystra and he revives, he goes back into the city. Mm -hmm. When people are chanting for him in Ephesus at the amphitheater, mm -hmm. he's wanted to go in there. When, when the jail breaks open in Philippi, he doesn't escape from an open jail because, hey, there's a guy in here I need mm -hmm. to talk to about Jesus. God. So nothing uh, to him was more important. He didn't cringe. He didn't apologize. If he goes to the Agora because he needs to buy something, he's going there with a secondary purpose or maybe the primary purpose of sharing the gospel. If he goes to the game, it's not for the love of the game. It's for the love of the people at the game. He eats not because of his love of food, but because of his love of the gospel. He's not ashamed. And so when it comes to the gospel, he is urgent and he is persistent. He says, I've been changed. I'm the one who stood still stone-faced, ready to crush the life out of Stephen, and we did. I put people in prison. I'm the one who sentenced to people to death. I'm the one whose life God has changed. Everything about me has changed. My friendships have changed. I now wander around sharing this gospel message, and that's all I'm about. Today, if Paul were alive, he'd be one of those guys who has a bunch of glow pamphlets or, or tracks in his <laughs> pocket, and everywhere he goes, it doesn't matter with whom, he's sharing some literature, getting gas. Hey, have you heard about Jesus? Jesus. Hey, how about you? He's on the phone to the utility company. Sometimes those phone calls are really irritating. Mm. <laughs> and he says, have you heard about Jesus? Uh, can I tell you a little bit about my Savior? In whatever way God would prompt him to do that. At the grocery store, Paul's the kind of guy who wherever he went, and this is the kind of guy I want to be, talked about Jesus. Mm. All right. So, what does this mean? Well, he, he would had to flee from Berea, uh, accompanied here. And so what's he going to do walking around this city? Oh, I better talk about Jesus. Mm. Uh, well, that's the only thing I'm going to talk about. So in the city full of idols, that's what he does. This agora right down below the Acropolis, uh, you know, he's talking about Jesus because my lesson title, Paul in the Areopagus you don't just burst into the Areopagus mm. <laughs> and say, hey, I've got a new idea for you to banter around. You have to be invited. You people have to want to hear. And so that's why this little idea of Paul working in the marketplace is so important because that's where the Epicureans and that's where the Stoic philosophers heard him. Let's look at the text now in Acts 17, verse 18 through 21. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? <laughs> Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Well, who are these Epicureans, these Stoic philosophers? The remnants of their philosophy are still with us here today. The Epicureans, uh, starting right there er, about 300 BC, taught that there is just matter, just material, only, only the physical reality. There is no afterlife, no gods that must be appeased. Mm. You just need to do what is necessary for you to have a comfortable life right here. Enjoy the life of, that you have. Don't, don't have unreasonable expectations so you won't get disappointed. Mm. Uh, the luxuries and the benefits you should not be seeking after. The usefulness of government and education is only insofar as they can help me to have a comfortable life right here here and right now. In other words, just relax, all right? Uh, enjoy life. Don't stir up conflict and don't stir up problems. Are there people in the world's marketplace of ideas who are believing that right now? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. All sorts of people. Right? And, and Paul recognizes that philosophy is not just held by philosophers, it permeates the people in culture. And as he talks, the people with those ideas, they're starting to question a little bit. Mm. What's this guy saying? All right? And some of them, they get triggered, they get worked up really quickly and they, they kind of want to argue with him a little bit. All right, the Stoics had a similar foundation of materialism. If there's no spiritual realm that you need to appeal to, you just need to look to yourself, all right? You're going to be the only one who can solve this earth's physical problems, your spiritual problems, whatever they may be. 
And so they believed that life functioned according to natural laws. And what you need to do is figure out how the natural laws of life work and get yourself in accordance with them because they're not going to change. You can get yourself to follow and do what is right according to the laws of nature. There's some connections here that Paul certainly can make. And I imagine that he did, but we don't have transcripts of everything that he said here. All right. So the Stoics, don't bother trying to control stuff you can't control. Control yourself. So continuing on now, verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. See, there it is there. They, he couldn't take himself. They bring him there, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you're bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. It, they're willing to hear him out. In other words, Paul was pleasant. He wasn't, he wasn't defensive. He wasn't unkind. He didn't criticize. Mm -hmm. He spoke in such a way that they, they were willing to listen to him, uh, even if they disagreed with him. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Mm. <laughs> and so they say, come on up to the Areopagus. The Areopagus means Mars Hill. In other words, a little outcropping of rocks named after the god of war, Mars. Because at one point in, in past, before Paul's time, this had been a legal court. Uh, a judicial tribunals for, tribunals for major crimes took place here at the Areopagus. But in Paul's day, it was no longer a court of uh, of, of law, it was a court of ideas. Mm -hmm. And even in Paul's day, the, uh, the Lyceum of Aristotle and Plato's Academy still functioned there in this city, all right? But this was a gathering place, big thinkers. Mm -hmm. uh, argued things out good-naturedly. So what do we do? What is, the, what is the Areopagus of today? That we may not necessarily be invited, uh, can't burst our way into, but we could be invited to by uh, the way that we communicate, all right? Um, it might be social media. Mm -hmm. That's one area where ideas get talked about constantly. Uh, did Paul necessarily seek out the Areopagus? No, but he was invited there. Should we have a presence on social media? Mm -hmm. Following the Holy Spirit's prompting, you may. If that's where you are, interacting with people, have a witness among those who are talking about the ideas of the day. Big universities, major universities, big ideas are talked about back and forth there. God may be prompting you, if that's the position where you're in, to, in a godly way, in the way that, you, that he leads, speak and share. Paul didn't just live a good life in Athens and hope people saw something different. He spoke out. And there's times where we must do that. Another place where ideas are, are shared, and this is Hollywood. And I, I don't know whether or not God is calling some to say, I need you to minister there where ideas are spread to the world. I want them to go out. What does this mean for us? Paul did not run away from conversations with people, even the skeptics, even those who challenged him. He had to talk with people. We gotta talk with people to share the gospel. And we talk in a place where it's simple in the marketplace and God will open up doors to say, I've got somebody else over here that wants to hear, somebody looking for the new idea that will change their life. Amen, mm, amen. Yeah. amen, thank you, Daniel. I was so caught up in what you were saying, I, I <laughs> forgot you. about the time. Praise God, we are st still studying Acts chapter 17. We're not done yet, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abiansabbathschoolpanelcom A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back, friends. We're going to pass the time over to Jill Marconi. Thank you so much, Pastor James and Daniel. What an incredible study. I love Acts chapter 17. Well, to be honest, I love the Apostle Paul, his writings, his epistles. He's an incredible man of God. He was an incredible man of God. And 
Um, he's one of the men I want to meet in heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to talking to Paul. Um, on Tuesday's lesson, we look at Paul and the unknown God. Daniel set it up so beautifully. He's brought from the marketplace here to the Areopagus. And I have two verses that we're going to discuss, and then Shelley and Pastor John will pick up on the rest of that. We're in Acts 17, 22 and 23. It's interesting that Athens is no longer the political center of the Greco-Roman world. Corinth now was. Now Athens used to be, but it no longer was. Corinth now was, but Athens is still at this time the university center of the world. Mm -hmm. It's the place where the intellectuals and the intellectual ideas were brought forth, like in that venue, mm -hmm. such as the Areopagus. It's a highly intellectual metropolis. Aristotle and Plato, as you already referenced, had taught there, and the Stoics and Epicureans were there as well currently. It was filled with temples and false gods. One ancient writer said, it is easier to find a god in Athens than a man. Mm. That's incredible. Mm. They had upwards of 30,000 gods in Athens. Oh my goodness. Mm. So into this place, we enter Paul. Now you would think that he would come forward and, and preach against idolatry, but we don't find that. It's very interesting. I found in my two verses, four principles for how to reach the unreached. Mm -hmm. Principle number one, find something to compliment in them or their worship. Mm -hmm. Or find that in Acts 17, 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Now, he could have come in and said, Why do you all worship idols? You have 30,000 gods at Athens and you, have, you shouldn't do that. No. He actually found something to compliment in them and in their worship. He complimented that they were religious. It was a misguided religious understanding. Even though they worship false gods, they were religious. We often sometimes lead with criticism or disrespect. Have you ever heard that? When we try to witness, you really go to church on Sunday? Why do you talk in other tongues like that? Do you believe the law was nailed to the cross? Why do you pray to Mary or other saints? Why do you follow tradition over the authority of the word of God? You mean to tell me you're not vegan yet? Don't you know how to tithe? Is that how you really keep the Sabbath? Now, we do that within our own denomination or cross-denominationally. First thing, when reaching the unreached, find something to compliment in them or their worship. Mm -hmm. My in-laws are incredible at this. Mom and Dad Morricone, they're so good at working with other people. And every time I'm with them in a setting with other people, I always see them talking like, oh, you have a new garden or you did something to your hair, you know, like the mom, the, my mom to the woman. Um, always complimenting, always something to do with the person. Hmm. Or you could find something in their worship. You know, some churches are very reverent. You could compliment their reverence. Some churches, they love Jesus or they're passionate about him. Some um, religions have a focus on health, even though they don't even believe in Jesus. You could start with that. Principle number two, study their religion and be respectful toward it. Mm -hmm. We're in Acts 17, we're in verse 23. Paul speaking, as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, he took time to consider how they worshiped, even their idols. Sometimes we can be a know-it-all with our beliefs, but he was respectful toward their religion and took time. I don't know if you've ever read the book, I don't know how you pronounce it, Bruchko? Okay. It's an incredible story. Bruce Wilson, he took the gospel to the South American Indian tribe, the Motoloni tribe. It's an amazing book. Young man, there was disease, there was torture, there was misfortune, there was difficulty in sharing the gospel with this tribe. Eventually, years later, when he actually shared the gospel, he told the story of the incarnation with one of their own fables. It was that of a man becoming an ant. And at that moment, the tribe began to understand what Jesus had done. Mm 
So he incorporated principles of their own understanding. These are some philosophical questions we, we have when we take the gospel across culturally. How does one communicate the gospel in a different culture? How much do missionaries need to be immersed in that culture before they actually begin to preach the gospel? And what traditions and customs from the local people need to be preserved while still maintaining Christian identity? Number three, Paul started with common ground. We're still in Acts 17, 23. He says, as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Who is their unknown God? And how in the world is this a point of common ground? Now, it's very interesting. We're going to find later in Shelley's day that Paul actually quotes from one of their poets. This is Epimendus, or however you pronounce his name. So he quotes from him. But in addition, uh, around 600 BC, there was a great pestilence. And the Athenians believed that this poet, Epimendus, had somehow circumvented or saved them from this great pestilence. And you know how he did it? He stood in the Areopagus and he let go sheep black and white sheep. And they went throughout the town of Athens and everywhere the sheep laid down, they sacrificed. So maybe a sheep laid down next to one of their gods, okay, their altars, so they would sacrifice to that particular God's name. Well, sometimes the sheep would lay down and there was no altar there. They built an altar there and it was named to the unknown God. Mm -hmm. So when Paul brings this up, the unknown God, he's standing in the same place, the Areopagus, that their famed poet had stood. And the poet had used um, this, during this pestilence, had used this with a sheep for the unknown God. Mm -hmm. And then that would connect its common ground immediately in the people's minds. They would remember what had taken place before. In other words, he's taking a piece of their history and he's connecting that with them. But he didn't just stay on common ground and that's important. Sometimes we think, oh, we'll be nice to people. Oh, we'll be respectful to their religions. Oh, we're gonna find common ground and we stop there. No, he did not stop there. Number four, he bridged from common ground to the truth in the word of God. Mm. We see this still in Acts 17 verse 23. As I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found the altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Here's his bridge. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Mm. Paul is brilliant. You know, when you read that and you hear what he shares here to the Athenians and the Areopagus, right. Areopagus, he's brilliant. The way he introduces Jesus in a way that they would not, they would have been against if he had come in with idol worship and preaching against that, they would have been against it. But the way he introduces it, finds this point of common ground in their history with the unknown God, mm -hmm. and then bridges to the truth in the word of God. You know, it's interesting to me in 1 Corinthians 9, there's a passage here, 19 through 23. I don't know if we'll get through all of it, but it's interesting how Paul becomes all things to all people in order to win others. He says, though I'm free from all men, I made myself a servant that I might win the more. Mm -hmm. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those under the law, as, though, as those under the law, that I might win those under the law, to those without the law, as without the law, not being without law toward God, mm. but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law, to the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And it's interesting to me when Paul was in Thessalonica, mm -hmm. when thought Paul was in Berea, I'm sure, even though we're not told how he presented the gospel, he presented the gospel differently mm -hmm. because it depends on the people group. It depends on the culture. It depends on the people that you are talking to. But the important thing is that we need to share the gospel. God calls us to share the gospel, to get out of our own preconceptions, preconceived ideas of how it needs to be shared. I only share in this way. No, get out of that. Get out of yourself and be open to new ideas and new ways that you can share the gospel. 
Great. Good. And amen. Thank you to all three of you wonderful. for a wonderful. Uh, Wednesday's is lesson is introducing a new God. So here's Paul on Mars Hill, and he does this masterful presentation at the Areopagus. And Luke, most likely, just hit the summary points. You know, we read the Bible, and sometimes yeah. we just are, we're so limited because they couldn't put it all in there. But I just wanted to expand just a little bit. Think about this. Paul is so brilliant that he is appealing. The Epicureans had this idea of life that you should just uh, try to get the maximum amount of pleasure out of life, the least amount of pain. Their idea was eat, drink, and be merry, and if it feels good, do it. Now the Stoics, as you were talking about them, their philosophy, life is filled with good and bad. You've got to, they held on to a life of self-denial and their motto was grin and bear it. Hmm. But Paul ca has got such mastery mm -hmm. that because it's the power of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. that he appeals to these vastly different listeners. He, he, he sought to establish the rapport with them without compromise. That's, That's important. Good. And he proclaimed the unknown God, the one they were worshiping without knowing. But here's, and, and as you said, he actually, he didn't do an Old Testament dump of scriptures. <laughs> That's true. That's right. He, he actually even quoted from their own uh, poets. So what did he do? He declared God, the character of God and what he had done. And he trusted that the Holy Spirit was going to convict him of truth. We're going to look at verses 24 through 27. Jill started that his classic Mars Hills address started in verse 22 and 23. That was the introduction. But in verses 24 through 27, Paul thoughtfully introduces four truths. I want you to watch for these four truths about God. First, he presents God as the creator of all things. Mm -hmm. Second, he presents God as the sustainer of all things. Third, he presents God as the one who ordains all things. And finally, he presents God as the God who wants to be known, who wants us to seek him. So let's look at Acts 17, 24. Paul says, God who made the world and Everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Mm. So he's introducing God as the creator, a personal God mm. who created the cosmos, the heaven and the earth, which was completely contrary to the Greek philosophies. Mm. The Epicureans actually believed that matter was eternal mm. and there was no creator. The Stoics kind of were like pantheistic. They believed that God was a part of all things. But Paul says, he created all things, all the earth, heavens and earth, and all things therein. You know what? No one can claim utter ignorance of our creator. Mm -hmm. You can look around and see that there was intelligent design. There yes. was a loving design to our world. But here's what's interesting. He's saying to them, hey, this God doesn't live in temples made by human hands. As Paul's addressing them, these philosophers are looking out over Athens at all of these temples that were made with human hands. And he said, this God doesn't dwell in those temples. So Acts 17, 25, he says, nor is he worshipped with men's hands. That actually, their worship, it means to be served with hands. 
he's, he's going to show them worship is spiritual. It's justice, mercy, and humility rather than materialistic mm -hmm. because what does God say? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So he's nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So God is a sustainer. He doesn't need humans to give, provide for him. He provides for us. And the sustaining activity of our creator is what gives our universe the stability that it has. Colossians 1.17, speaking of Jesus, says he is before all things and in him all things consist. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 1.3 says that he upholds the world by his mighty word of power. Mm -hmm. So Paul is showing them, hey, worship is not to be serving God with your hands as much as it is serving him with your heart. Micah 6, 8 says, he has shown you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So Paul presents God as the supreme giver. And he is the one who gives to all of his creation and who wants a love relationship mm -hmm. with them. We need him to supply our needs, even the physical breath of our existence. So Acts 17, 26, he says, He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. This is from Adam's blood. And it has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So. God is the ordainer. He guides the affairs of humanity. He is in control of what happens. He has a plan and he works all things according to his will. And you know what? His plan is to give what's best for our eternal benefit. Remember that. So contrary, this is contrary to the Greeks' philosophy. They, they thought, hey, if you're not Greek, you're, you're nothing. I mean, really, they believed they were a superior race and that all non-Greeks were barbarians. Mm. And so the idea that a loving God who created all things, who sustains all things and is the provider of all things and looks at all men the same, created them all from one blood. This was pretty strange mm. to their ears. Mm -hmm. So he is the God of providence, Paul is saying. He placed the boundaries around. You know, the Epicureans believed in all these gods, but they believed that God never interfered. None of their gods interfered in the affairs of men. Mm -hmm. And the Stoics didn't denied any divine presence or guidance in life. So Paul goes on in Acts 17, 27, he says, so that he does all these things. He's our creator, our sustainer, our provider. He's the ordainer so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. God created each one of us. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, with eternity in our hearts, it doesn't matter what your station is in life. That's right. If you don't have God in your heart, you've got a God-shaped hole in your heart. And so what God is doing here, and Paul is saying is, God wants you to seek me, to grope. It's like you're groping blindly, but Hebrews 11, 6 says what? That God wants us to know that he exists and that he rewards those who Diligent. earnestly mm -hmm. seek him. So the Lord is near, Paul saying, he's not far away. He reveals himself to those who seek him the God of love, this creator, this sustainer, this ordainer was a God who wanted to be known. Mm -hmm. The idea of in Greek mythology is that the gods 
were cruel. They were unpredictable, self-centered. So this was an incredibly intriguing thought to these mm. people. And Paul met them right where they were. And some of these men took their first baby steps to come to Jesus. Yeah. Wow, thank you, James and Daniel and Jill and, and uh, Shelley for laying out. I love the not only the theology of the study, but also the history behind it. Yes. And it's so rich. You know, we talk about Areopagus, mm -hmm. this word that is a tongue twister for those of us who just speak English all day long. It's literally located, I'll begin with some of the geographical aspects of it. It's literally located in an Athenian city uh, near a place called uh, Ares, which is located on Mars Hill, as um, Daniel pointed out. And it was erected in the presence of the Greek God that you talked about on Mars Hill, uh, the God of war. It's in this place that there's also uh, the center of temples, mm -hmm. uh, cultural facilities, and also the high court. And so Paul is invited. We read that in Acts chapter 24, verse 19. He's invited there because these uh, Athenian elites hear him speaking and they're saying, this guy is speaking about a God that seems foreign to us. Mm -hmm. And um, he's speaking to them in the presence of uh, what they call the unknown God is the Greek phrase, the agnostos theos, with, from which we get the word agnostics, mm -hmm. which mean they believe that they really can't know anything about the true existence of God. So they created, as Jill described so wonderfully, uh, this place called the unknown God where they worshiped. And these were very well educated men. And so Shelley laid the foundation from verses uh, 24, actually on down to 27. So I'm going to pick up where Shelley left off. In light of what the Apostle Paul says, the question is, how do they respond? Mm -hmm. and, and my lesson is entitled, Crossing the Line. So we're going to talk about where he crossed the line. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to know how to get to the line, and you have to know when it's safe to cross the line. That's good. Because Paul did cross the line. You've got to know where to speak about things that we can identify with, but you have to get to the point where, as Paul said to the Corinthians, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Mm -hmm. To the Romans, he says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, but became vain in their imagination and their foolish hearts were darkened. What the Apostle Paul also recognized is that when you don't serve the true God according to his word, his understanding, his dictates, you remain in darkness, quote unquote, agnostos theos, the unknown God. And then Paul, the person who believes that there's nothing we can learn about him, they create thousands of gods and they said, well, either one you pick is sufficient because we don't know him anyhow. Let's see where Shelley left off. After Paul reviewed and, and revealed to them who this God is, notice what he continues to say in Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 17, and um, verse 28 to 34. A moment ago, I said Acts 24, 19. I actually mean Acts 17, 19, just to make that correction. He says, beginning in verse 28 of Acts chapter 17, for in him, the one I just revealed to you, we live and move and have our being. And also some of your own poets have said, now he brings in the identity. Mm -hmm. This is not just my belief. Your own poets have said that. For we are also his offspring, Wow, that's convicting. Your poets have said that we are God's offspring. So he's now finding a common ground yeah. to pull in this grander, broader understanding of the God that they just don't know. Mm. And he says in verse 29, therefore, now, he's, now he goes beyond assumption to fact. Since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Now he's stepping over. He's mm -hmm. getting closer and closer to the line because <laughs> there are thousands of gods in their visual sight. And these elites are thinking, mm, where's he headed with this? <laughs> then he says, verse 30, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but today is gonna to be an awakening day. Mm -hmm. But now at this moment, yeah. commands all men everywhere to repent, including you. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. Now he's bringing in Jesus. Mm -hmm. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. <laughs> Wait a minute. 
he just crossed the line. Mm. Because look at verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we'll talk about this later. Mm. We'll hear you again on this matter. Mm -hmm. And notice what happened. At that moment, the meeting ended. Mm -hmm. We invite you to speak. That's it. That's it. We don't want to hear any more. We'll talk about this again another time. And Paul, as he's leaving, notice what it says in verse 33. As he's leaving, so Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him mm. and believed. Among them, Dionysus, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Mm. I was once on this, um, this uh, social media platform. Uh, I forgot the name of the social media platform, but speaking to the Hebrew Israelites was very common. And, um, and um, Ivor Myers invited me to be on that. And people, they, they were just so, um, if you said anything they didn't agree with, they went, they went, uh, they went. Uh, ballistic. They went ballistic. That's <laughs> the best word. They went, they literally told you off. Mm. And I listened as I waited my turn for more than an hour to speak. And finally, I mean, they were cutting people off in one minute, two minutes, 30 seconds. They were just, grrr. <laughs> when my turn came, I had listened to all the arguments they stated and put together a run and I spoke to them for 20 minutes uninterrupted. Mm. One of them made an attempt to interrupt me about a minute and one of the he Hebrew Israelite ladies said, let him speak, let him speak. Well, when I got, when I crossed the line, they went ballistic and one guy just with all his voc vocal volume just, just really shredded my earlobes and I just ended. I just, I said, I'm not gonna have anybody speak to me that way and I disconnected. And Ivor called me back and said, why did you disconnect? Nobody's ever spoken for 20 minutes to these guys. They just don't listen. Mm. Go back to your page and see what happened. 38 people joined my thread and said, I want to find out more. Mm. Mm. So I understand what Paul means when he had followers, even though the matter caused division, somebody believed. Mm. So you see, when we cross the line, understand it's, there's an art to crossing the line. You have to do it in such a way that you have weaved the truth of God so wonderfully, so welcomingly that people said, I want to hear more. And I went to my page the first day on that, that website, I forgot what it was called, and I had all these new followers, people that were not even Christians at all saying, I want to know more. He mm. said, you were heard, people listened. You see, friends, there is an art to presenting Jesus Christ in a way that people that are not yet where you are will follow you where you are and then they will, when you cross the line, continue following. It doesn't say that these men invited him back to speak at another date, but it did say Paul was successful. So I'm gonna outline, Jill, very quickly as I can, seven methods of presenting the gospel. The first one in uh, Acts chapter eight and verse 30, first of all, make it clear. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said to him, do you understand what you are reading? First, the gospel has to be clear. When you present Jesus, make it clear. C.D. Brooks said, make it clear. And if they don't understand, preach it again and make it even clearer. Mm. Make it clear. Secondly, become personally acquainted with the truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Know what you're talking about. And if you don't understand, say, I'll get back to you. Don't appear as though you know everything. Thirdly, begin studying the Bible as soon as possible. 2 Timothy 3, verse 14 and 15. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have heard them. And look at this. And that from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I admire the way Daniel raises his family. Mm. His children know the Bible. Somebody once said, wow, they know the Bible better than I do. Mm. You got to teach them when they are young and when they can absorb it like a spiritual sponge. Fourthly, live what you believe. First Timothy 4, 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Know what you believe and live it. Mm -hmm. Number five, leave the results to God. First Corinthians three, verse six to eight. I planted, mm -hmm. Apollos watered, but God. God gave the increase. Right. So then neither he who plants is anything mm -hmm. nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Mm -hmm. Now he who plants and he who waters are one and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. God will bless you, but God is gonna be responsible for the results. Number six, be patient and not anxious. Mm -hmm. 
Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary in while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. And number seven, God's word will accomplish his purpose. Yes. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Isaiah 55 and verse 11. So when you meet somebody that does not know the God you know, be patient, be kind, because this is the saying that I want to end with. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Excellent, excellent thoughts. Thank you, everyone. We've got time for a few closing remarks. We'll start with Daniel. Yes, when Paul does not find the gospel flourishing in Athens, he looks for the seeds of gospel that God has preserved everywhere. Amen. Amen. As we think about Paul at the Areopagus, or you, me, all of us, when we're seeking to witness for Jesus, I think an important key is the Holy Spirit. We cannot witness without the Holy Spirit. I'm reminded of Luke chapter 12. Sometimes we get afraid what we're going to speak or say. It says, for the Holy Spirit will teach you, Luke 12, 12, in that very hour, what you shall say. Amen. Paul presented God as the creator, as the one who was the sustainer, as the one who did all things according to his will. But he presented him as a God who wanted a love relationship mm -hmm. and wanted to be known. Mm -hmm. Remember that that is the most important desire of God's heart and include that when you are talking to others mm -hmm. about our Lord. You know, there's a decision line be between ignorance and enlightenment. And you've got to pray for God to give you wisdom to understand that when you sense that moment is present, you do as Joshua did, and I'm sure Paul did this also. Joshua 24, 15, notice what he said, similar to Paul's day. Now, if it, see, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And notice the context. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land we dwell, but here's your personal conviction mm -hmm. that we must all make before we are qualified to present Jesus. But as for me and my house, mm -hmm. we will serve the Lord. Amen, amen. Thank you, John. I really appreciated that emphasis that you had in relationship to um, knowing when to cross the light and how to bring people to it. Mm -hmm. And I also appreciated what you shared, Shelley, that God is presented as the supreme giver, the supreme provider, the sustainer, the creator. He loves all men and he's close to all men. Yeah. And Shelley, what you, I mean, Jill, what you shared, finding common ground mm -hmm. as a path to sharing the truth, becoming all things for all people. And then of course, Daniel, Paul is sold out for Jesus. He's just sold out for Jesus. And I love that because God wants us to be filled with his spirit. So we're sold out for Jesus. So, so that wherever we find ourselves, we just forget about the persecution in the past and we are just sold out for Jesus. We're not done. Mission to the Unreached Part 2 next week. Join us.